All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Long and Winding Royal Road. My name is W.H. Park, and this show is a show dedicated to the greatest period of in-ring wrestling in the history of professional wrestling, at least in my opinion, and in the opinion of many people, including my guest today, who we'll get to in a second. But uh, yeah, so this show is a celebration of 1990s All Japan Pro Wrestling, the era of the Royal Road, the King's Road, the the greatest booker maybe in the history of professional wrestling, Giant Baba, and his and his and his uh, you know his uh, the people who who brought his vision to life, the four pillars, Mizuharu Masawa, Toshaki Kawada, Ken Kobashi, Akira Tawe, and of course Stan Hansen, uh, Jun Akiyama, and and others. And later on, Vader. He would come in and he'd be part of that whole scene as well. Great stuff. And and uh, as part of people who are on the YouTube can see, who are very, very special guests here on episode 22, is, is a big fan of 1990s All Japan Pro Wrestling. And uh, probably, I would say right now in 2022, one of the most popular wrestlers in the world today. And and that's Eddie Kingston from AEW. Eddie, hey, how are you today? What's up? As you can see, I'm very uncomfortable with compliments, but uh, yeah, we're here to talk about my favorite time period in wrestling, um, and two guys who inspire me all the time, uh, in uh, Kawada and Kobashi, and um, that's why I wear certain colors in the ring. For those who don't know why, and. Um, also, I, I think this is the perfect match to introduce new people mm -hmm. to the style, to what All Japan 90s was, because to me, this is a mixture of the old, old way they would do the matches and then lead into the, the head drops that became pretty dangerous by 98, 99. Well, it's interesting. Like, it is interesting you say that because like, I really feel, we'll get to, to the match a bit more. I do want to get... Some uh, ask you a couple of questions first about your your fandom of of this of these yeah. era. Oh, also, but just one thing about this match that I said earlier before we went live that I've honestly watched this match almost almost every big match I've had. I watched I've watched this match just for inspiration or just for me to get my mind off the match. Uh, anything just to fill my time. And the funny thing is, I watched this with a, a Japanese legend once because I was just in the car with him and watching it on my phone. And I said, oh, hey, check this out. I'll tell you who it is when we're off here. But okay, <laughs> yeah, and he was just he looked at me like I was like, oh, yeah, this is the best. But anyway, that's all I want to say about the match before we get to it. Yeah. So, so I, my my thing was like, you know, we talk about the de detail of the match structure, but it's a very methodical match. Yeah. And it really does harken back to like 1980s and maybe even the 70s. If you watch like Jumbo Saruta, you know, wrestling Terry Funk, or even like I think, you know, a good example would be Nick Bockwinkle versus Jumbo Saruta for the AWA yeah. title with the title switch. But then it does move into what we call the King's Road and yeah. in, in, with the head drops and like the big moves and stuff mm. like that. But I, I, I will talk about the details of my own feelings about watching this. I, it's been a long time. Oh, since okay. I had watched this match, so like I was like, a ref it was kind of a refresher for me, and it's like, oh right, this is the match that's like structured like this. It's very different yeah. from other title matches of the time. It's it is for the triple crown, and we'll maybe we should talk about what match we're going to talk about. Eddie, okay, tell us which match we're gonna we're gonna be talking about here on today's episode. Oh, now you're gonna put me on the spot to remember the date and everything. I'll tell you the date. <laughs> it's June twelfth, nineteen ninety eight. It emanates yeah. from uh, the Nippon Budokan. Budokan Hall. And it, who are our participants in this match, though? Uh, Toshiaki Kawada, who is the Triple Crown champion at the time, uh, against my personal favorite and number one, Kenta Kobashi. Kenta Kobashi. So, Kenta Kobashi, to me, uh, people ask me, who's your favorite pillar? And I always say Kawada, because Kawada has the most interesting story of the yes. four. But if you ask me who who my, like, my overall favorite wrestler is, of the four, I will always say Kenta Kobashi because I think you can't build a perfect wrestler better than Kenta Kobashi. No, no, you can't. He's like he's his look, everything you want, his fire, his selling, his psychology. Mm -hmm. He has everything you would want. If you were, if you're going to build a promotion and you wanted who will be my ace of the company, who will be my top baby face, 
I would say you better pick Kenny Kobashi over anyone yeah. else in the history yeah. of wrestling. So if, that, if that's the style you want. I think Terry Funk. You give me 1980s t- Terry Funk with Kenny Kobashi. Can you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine? Madness. Madness. If, they, if, they, if they work the same era. I mean, we're, I think we're blessed that we had Stan Hansen cross so many yeah. eras. Yes. Yeah. But Stan like, Hansen's I, very – I don't hear a lot of people – well, the youngins anyway, as I call them. The youngins don't talk about Stan that much, and I don't understand why, but – I try to educate. <laughs> you educate. Show, I mean, so much of his stuff is on YouTube and not yeah. just the All Japan stuff, but the stuff he did in Georgia and like in the AWA Ooh. and like so many other places. I think you could probably find like the matches he had with Bruno in WWF. Yeah, yeah you well. could definitely, you know, scrub around and find yeah, They're that. out there. Yeah. They're out there in the dark. I also uh, remember a story Stan, Stan Hansen said about Terry Funk that uh, actually Terry told me this. Terry told told us a story about Stan Hansen that Stan still calls him. And when they talk, he always thanks him for helping him get to Japan. So, cause like he says that his career was saved and that's where he made the most money. So still to this day, all these years later, he still thanks Terry Funk. Yeah. I mean, Terry Funk is all over Stan Hansen's book. You know, like that, that being said, I will say probably our next biography episode is going to be about Stan Hansen. Oh, I'll be, I'll be listening to it on the phone. Yeah. So yeah. you definitely like Stan Hansen is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Like yeah. definitely the, the, uh, the top gaijin to ever wrestle in Japan. Even to this day, like when I was working in Japan and living in Japan up until like about two years ago, like no one would talk about like necessarily the, who other people like might think are the, Oh, these guys are super famous in Japan as rest as far foreign wrestlers wrestling there. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know this person? Like, for example, I'll say, Did you know who Kenny Omega is? They like maybe if I asked five people that who may or may not follow wrestling, maybe two people would know. Yeah. But if I said, Do you know who Stan Hansen is? They they would all know. Doesn't matter what even how old they, they were. I don't know, even if they like my friend had a girlfriend from Japan and I was like 16, we were young. And I remember asking her about Stan Hansen. And she goes, oh, the cowboy? That's they right. All, so if they didn't know Hanson by his name, they would say, oh, the cowboy. He he permeated Japanese pop culture to such an extent yeah. for so long that it's like he's an institution, like a cultural institution, yeah. not a wrestling institution, but a cultural institution. Yeah, guys there. like him and Dory and Terry Funk were like their stereotypical uh, Americans at that time. The big cowboys. That's and, right. And, you know what I mean? The crazy guys. We were... That was like the typical, stereotypical American for the Japanese crowds at that time. And they just fell in love with him. I tell everyone, you don't know what over is until you see Terry Funk walk into the ring in Japan or the Rock and Roll Express in Mid-South and in NWA. Like, that's over. Yeah. You know. Like, Stan Hansen was just a, a different animal. Him and Brody, of course. and then the, Oh, yeah, Brody. Was... Yeah, they, Brody still talked about to this day. You know what so, I mean? So let's talk about your own personal history with uh all japan for wrestling of the 90s because like you started off as i was correct me if i'm wrong you started off in chikara which is more yeah. of a which is more of a lucha based promotion so like yeah. your training was was based around like learning like kind of a lucha base and then traditional pro wrestling so yeah like later on when i i think i first discovered about your interest in all japan was through like your support of our mutual acquaintance friend Joseph Monticelio, yeah, who does the the, the walking the King, the walking the King's Road YouTube series, which I love. And of yeah. course, Joseph was our first guest. We're talking about the history of the Triple Crown. Go check out that episode. Yeah, with Jumbo, yeah. as I remember. Which, which, which <laughs> if you haven't already, but how did you, where did when did you discover All Japan Pro Wrestling and the Four Pillars? Well, uh, it's a funny story. Uh, I got out of wrestling around WrestleMania 12. I stopped watching wrestling. Uh, I was just over it. I was a teenager. I was done. Uh, a friend of mine showed me ECW, Gangsta's Paradise. Fell right back in love with wrestling. I was a teenager. What did I want? Women and violence, and that's what they gave me. And also characters that I fell in love with. But then because of that, I found uh, a certain video place, and I would just order whatever videos I wanted. And I was already a big fan of Masahiro Chono and the Great Muda because of watching NWA as a kid. So I just ordered a Best of Japan 1995. Just ordered it because I was like, maybe Chono Muda will be on it. Next thing you know, I'm watching this 60-minute match 
between Kobashi and Kawada. And I don't know their names at the time. So guy in black and yellow against a guy in orange. And I watched that match and I was, that's it. That was the match that made me fall in love with all Japan. And it was the physical style. It was the selling. It was the emotion and the struggle just to win the match. That's what caught me. You know what I mean? And that's when I fell in love. And that's when I went back to the website, looked up their names, and then just snowballed. And I'm on message boards trying to find out the history. I'm reading about Ricky Dozan. You know what I mean? I'm going as far back as I can because I'm one of those people when I'm into something, I'm into it. Right. You know what I mean? I, there's no halfway with it, you know? And I was so into it that it just, ca- you know, captured me. It did. Just it was the pro wrestling I wanted to a do and and b watch. Right, and that does that include getting dropped on your head a lot? No, that part <laughs> no. I. Oof. But dropping yeah. people on their heads is is the. I try. The I part. try not to. It all depends on no, no, who I'm in not. there with, who I like or not. <laughs> I mean, I, I I mean, your last big match was with Chris Jericho, and I I was watching that. I was like, whoa! I mean, it felt as close to like what AEW could present as, as an all Japan match to yeah. me. And I was like, I was like, I was very surprised at some of the bucks bumps that happened in that match. So kudos so, to both you, so, and, you and Jericho. So was I. So was I. I was very <laughs> surprised as well on, on all ends. Very surprised. Um, and match was fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. It was a really, well, I think good. match that I would be like, wow, I think I should like, I don't necessarily watch AEW regularly, but like if it's more, if you're going to present more of that style, along with the other, like have a nice variety of styles, which yeah. I, I like, then that's awesome. Like I would, I'll, I'll like, I gotta make it appointment viewing. Yeah, so. and, I, and this is not a plug for AEW, but that's one of the reasons why I love the company is that you can have me open up with a style I like to do. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you got the Lucha brothers going insane and the Bucks doing what the Bucks do. You know what I mean? It's a, and now you got, you know, whether I don't like them, but you got Punk doing what he does. It's just a, it's different for everybody. Anyway, I don't want to plug. That's sure, it. Sure. That's we'll, it. we'll get to plugs maybe at the at the end of this episode. But yeah, I don't. I don't want to. Do, it's not about that. I'm not here for that. You know what but, I mean? Let, but you, I mean, obviously, you love Kawada and you love yeah. Kawashi. We've we've talked about that. But let's get like you know, like some quick quick feelings uh, from you about Mitsuhara Masawa, Akira Tawe, and Jun Akiyama in, in yeah. that order, maybe. Uh well, Masawa, uh, I nicknamed him ace forever you know what i mean that's that will always be my ace no matter what company or who says what he's forever the ace to me he was the reason why he's not one of my favorites was because he was too smooth for me right yeah i mean everything he did was so smooth even the elbow even though it looked like death on guys it still was so smooth and it was too smooth for me but that does not mean i don't appreciate the greatness that he was, and I understand why he was loved and what he was, you know? And he was, for the Japanese culture, for those who don't know, he was a pretty guy to them. So the women loved him. The men loved how he, you know, people say, oh, he didn't sell that time out. He sold the way he was supposed to sell, the way the ace was supposed to sell. He was for the Japanese people. He wasn't going to be westernized, I guess you could say, with his selling the way Kobashi and Kawada are. You know what I mean? He was more the Japanese culture of selling, like shrugging it off or wiping, you know, the eyebrow or, you know, feeling it. But he also so different from when he wrestled Gaijin. You know what I mean? Then when he wrestled the other pillars. Anyway, I can get into that. Sure. Anyway. To Tell me. It. Yeah, that anyway, Masawa is the ace forever. Love him. Tawe, to me, is so underrated. Oh, yeah. And so funny to me. What he because he plays his role so great. As you know what I mean, the dirty guy of the of the group. You know what I mean? The guy who would doesn't mind taking a little bit of a shortcut. You know what I mean? And to me, he's so underrated. And you know what I mean? He was a, a big inspiration for the match with uh me and Chris. He was a very big inspiration for that match, but they they couldn't be all Japan Kings World style without Tawei. He's he's you can't replace someone like him. 
Also, he's part of two of the best tag teams of all time. The one yes. with Jumbo and, of course, the, the Holy Demon Army with Kawada. Yeah. So, yep. like, I, I, I... I was like that when I did the Tao White biography episode, I was just like, this guy needs to get into the Observer Hall of Fame. Like why people oh, haven't voted yeah. for him at up at that point. I'm like, that's that's nuts. And I I think I convinced John Pollock. Maybe I didn't convince John. I think John was already on board with the Tao White getting yeah. to the Hall of Fame and he stuff better like be. that. But uh, well, hey John, if you, you're watching this, I know John's <laughs> watching this, so he's like, Oh shit. I I he, he don't worry. He told me I voted for Tao this year. So yeah. no no worries about that. But let, let's talk about someone I know you are huge fan of as, yeah. as someone i think who's on your bucket list to wrestle one day yeah june akiyama yeah yeah that's my dream match is uh with june akiyama uh one because i'm a fan and, and two i can learn from him i'm still trying to learn after 20 years of wrestling i don't know anything so i'm still trying to learn everything so being able to go and and wrestle against someone like Jun Akiyama, I can learn a lot from, especially about the style and what Baba taught him as well. Like I, like I said, I'm a little bit of a historian, so I want to know what how, what everyone taught him. And also fight him and smack him and suplex him. And, right. You know, get well, you got to tuck in your shirt. You cannot wear your shirt loose because that's against the Baba way. Okay, well, that's what I'll do. As soon as I see him, I'll start... Tucking, tucking, in the shirt, shirt. tucking the shirt. I think he's the guy probably like, no, I don't want to tuck my shirt in, Bob. Yeah, I'm, like, yeah. I'm like too young for that shit. So. Well, that, that's one of the things that also attracted me to, to attracted me to him is that he seemed like a little cheeky guy. Like everybody else, you know, Kobashi, Kawada, Tawe were, you know what I mean? And Kawada was just angry. That's what, the way I saw it. And like they were all straight laced, you know, and then here comes Akiyama like, nah, I'm going to do what I want. You yeah, know what I mean? that is Akiyama for sure. Yeah, so like that to me attracted me to him. And then, of course, the moves first off got me with the Exploder Suplex, which I do, of course, and just everything he did. And then also his, his, his fire and him teaming up with Kobashi. And then uh, as the years went on, him becoming so great at singles matches when he finally beat Misawa in All Japan first. And then, of course, the split happened and him become a GHC champion. It's just, he's one of the greatest of all time. And yeah, I need to get in there with him one time. So are you just waiting for the phone call or email from Tony Khan saying, Eddie, I just talked to Takagi over in DDT. Yeah. And we're going to, and we're going to send you to Japan to wrestle him in Sumo Hall. Would that be like your dream come true? Yeah. Yeah. I can walk away. <laughs> I can walk away. So let me ask you though. If you since you are since you are so knowledgeable about Japanese wrestling, where would you rather wrestle him in Sumo Hall, in Budokan, or in Korokan Hall? Oh, Budokan. Budokan, yeah. that's the place to be. It, it could happen. Everyone's with, running uh, there again. right off the 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 Japanese flag, and you know the beginning of the match, and it shoots <laughs> down. That's what I need. That's, that's what you what need? I need. Okay. That's what I need. All right, we're gonna we're gonna get into the match now. But for <laughs> one more question, one more yeah, hypothetical yeah. question, I want to ask you. Okay. So let's imagine you tomorrow you get three emails from New Japan for Wrestling, Pro Wrestling Noah, and All Japan for Wrestling. Okay, and they and and everything is this, is pretty much equal. The money, the scheduled, and like the the push they promise you're going to get in the com- in their respective companies. Okay, who do you want to work for? Can you say? Is it a secret? Is it too much heat if you if you tell me? To on be air? honest with you, I want to do all three. How about that? I wish I could do all three, but no, on air I can't say. <laughs> I can't. Okay, okay. you tell me off uh, air. Okay. Keep it. To to be honest with you, I, I really can't say. But God, I would just love to do all three. To be totally honest, if that was ever a chance to do, right? One eighty, one of each, just one match of each, and then I'll do whatever anybody wants. That would be great. That would okay, be but then, but if dream. you were, if but if someone then said. We got a time machine. You can go back to 1996, All Japan for Wrestling, and work there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we for go sure? Back to, that's, yeah. That's go back sure. to 1989. 89? Let, we can, yeah, we can let me team up with Jumbo. Oh. Or actually, no. Let me team up with Tenru and Kawada. You know what I mean? Let me have fun. You're going to be part of the revolution? You get <laughs> yeah. the nice, the, the, sweet, the sweet ring jacket that they had? Oh, that's what I'm dying. I'm hang dying with, for one. Hang out with Fuyuki. Go, to, go, go <laughs> eat like Yakiniku with them and shit. Yeah. All right, that sounds good. I think you'd probably have a good time with with the with the Revolution boys. I, yeah. But Yuki's a little bit, you know, too much of a partier. I think from what I oh, understand. Oh no, I would, I would be. Yeah, he would. 
out drink me and I'll be like, I gotta go to sleep. I can't. Maybe I'll hang out to Kawad. I think he was the most sedate of the of those guys. Yeah. So yeah. But let, let's get into this match. This is from June 12th, 1998. It is for the Triple Crown. Toshiaki Kawada has just achieved his career goal of defeating, finally defeating Mitsuhar Masawa for that title. And he his kind of goal from this point on is to kind of have as long a title reign as Masawa's had with any of his previous three reigns, which would be, you know, very hard to accomplish. And, and no one's ever accomplished yeah. that during the, like the, the, you know, the, the pre-split era of, of the triple crown's history. But um, the, that's, so that's Kawada's story going into this match. Like he, he's, he did it. He, he, he finally beat Masawa. Yeah. But Ko, Kobashi's story is a little, I'm not as intense or, but the, with, with Kawada personally, he, he had never beaten him in a major televised singles match. He had beaten him once in a singles match during a, a champion carnival match this the same year in 1998, but that was not televised. And as far as I know, it's kind of a holy grail. Maybe it's yeah. never been broadcast. I've never seen it. I've never seen it either. Uh, also, the only time he ever got close by of beating Kawada the two times was draws. Yeah, he's only had draws with him. One was yeah. during his own. Uh, first reign as the Triple Crown champion. Though after he yeah. beat Tawe, he had a match with Kawada defending the title. He didn't beat him, but Kawada didn't beat him either. It went to a, a sixty-minute Broadway. That's the one that I watched in '95. That, and that's that was yeah, it. And that was it. That that got you into uh, where we are now. That's brought you to to yeah. the Long and Wine Royal Road here. Um, so this is his thing. This is his thing. He wants to beat Kawada. I think mm. more than get the Triple Crown. I feel he wants to beat. Kawada and he knows he can't do the same thing he's you know kind of have the same kind of matches he's had before yeah. with Kawada so I think that plays into the structure of this match so um I want to let's get into this match you know I fire it up well and, before we get into it yeah you know, here's here's a story I heard a rumor again okay don't know but this is his first defense of the title Kawada <clears throat> after he finally beat Masawa in the Tokyo Dome. And the, the rumor is that Kawada kind of spoke against Baba uh, during that time period about not working with other companies. And the reason why Kawada lost this match so soon was because of that. It was like a punishment. Yeah. That's the rumor. I don't know how true about. We'll never know how true it's, that is. It's actually pretty well documented that. Oh, he is wanted, it? Yeah, that he wanted okay. to do like what New Japan was doing with UWFI. Yeah, and he and he saw like we're leaving money on the table by not working with other companies or especially not doing like this kind of shoot thing that that New Japan has been doing with like yeah you know, like with UWFI. So and Baba was very isolationist to say the yeah. least. I mean, he did let some people like he had. You know, famously, high music do yeah the FMW you know, guys yeah kind of come in for 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 some shots and stuff like that. But but yeah, Kawada spoke out about it yeah to Baba and Baba's like said no, and then you're you're in the doghouse. It, it, this is a thing that was very common with Kawada. He was in the doghouse with Baba, well, a, and then everyone wonders why I like him. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> you know? he's he has that image, but like this is like I don't know if that led to him losing the title in this match, but it's probably you know what. It's very likely that likely, you're. Yeah, again, yeah. that's probably the rumor part that I was I was saying. So, but let, getting to this match, let's start off first of all. Yeah. The 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 ring entrance is you know Kovashi comes out first to the greatest, maybe the I in my opinion maybe the greatest you know tied theme song with, tied with Ricky Joshu's. With <laughs> Ricky like Joshu's. But this is this is Grand Sword. This is such an epic song. All the Pillars music actually is pretty yeah. epic. In, in this in this era and he gets into the ring and standing in his corner are members of like kind of his his kohais his his uh apprentices at this time one is yoshinobu kanamaru who's still wrestling to this day in yeah, Japan for one, wrestling. Of, one of the best one of the best doesn't get talked of enough no he does one not one of the best heels to ever yeah. work japan yeah to do to, to be a, a, a an effective legit heel in japan is not easy to do in no, my opinion not at all but he no. does it he does it really well and the other person is manakea mossman aka taiokea who another guy who i wish more people knew about and i tell locker room guys about him and 
I try to look, I try to find his matches all the time. <laughs> he is such a, he is a great, great guy. And he was like related to like, not related, but associated with Kawada, Kobashi as one of the guys that Kobashi would take under his wing in the yeah. dojo. And then later on, like, this is, I always find this interesting that like, you know, before the split, Akiyama and Kea were going to be a tag team. And I think Ke oh, Kea was going to be his, like what Akiyama was to Kobashi. Yeah. Kea was going to be to Akiyama be his okay. tag regular tag partner and they were gonna like probably form sternness in all japan at some point oh wow and then they were probably gonna probably gonna be kaya akiyama and and i think it's and, and kenamaru and probably okay. one more person probably one more person another junior yeah, wow. maybe imagine imagine that world <laughs> can you imagine it would have been like it would have been kaya akiyama uh omori and uh, takayama as like oh, wow. the next generation of guys that were gonna like yeah take yeah. over like reach that level of like the original four pillars but these guys are going to be like up there along with probably like i don't know i i, I feel wolf hawkfield J jim Steele was gonna was gonna probably get a big push you, you really don't like jim Steele, do you no i don't i don't just no. like jim Steele. he's not that, i don't i don't think he's that great you know like he got uh, saddled with that gimmick man they gave it to him they said they, they, go, they, sega saturn folks that's what it was that's right it was video game tie-ins with with japanese companies very natural fit at yep. the time so um but yeah then of course next is kawada with his with holy war his theme song yeah and he's coming to the ring with holding the triple crown the greatest collection of title books ever i went before the pandemic i went to the um the giant bob exhibit in tokyo oh wow and they had the original triple That's crown awesome. title belts on display and it was it was amazing to see that like, is so awesome like i i remember reading that like like one of the belts represents Ricky Dozan. Yeah. Because that was his belt. You know, yeah. another belt represents Baba because that was Baba's belt. You know what I mean? So. And when the other, that, the United National, I, I represented like Jumbo. Jumbo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought they it was the an belt. Okie real quick, but it. They, it, I think it, maybe United National, like Ricky Dozan is the NWA international title. Yeah. The PWF world title is Baba's because yeah. he, he created it. And then. United National, no, I, I'm pretty sure they created that for for Jumbo because for it's Jumbo, like, yeah, you're yeah. probably right on that. But like, I just love that kind of little history behind the belts as well, you know. Now, let me ask you a quick a side question. Then, do you think they should go back to the three belts, or do you do you what do you think about the current version of the Triple Crown? Like it unified, like the the plates unified into one title. I like I like it, but I'm so old school that I I like the three belts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, me personally, I grew people up know on that. I grew up on that. I love the new design, like yeah. that they've had because they had to give up the, the three belts. But like, you know, Kento Miyahara was, you know, he did this joint show with, you know, teaming with, with Tanahashi. And he got, and for that, for that occasion, like they gave him the original three belts, yeah. which he'd never worn before. And I just thought, you know what? Miyahara looks pretty good. Look how good it looks. Yeah. Look I remember. Belts. Yeah. So, I was like, look how good it yeah. looks. Yeah. But, you know, things happen. Hey, what if you what if you won the all Japan double tag team titles and because those are the original belts still so. yeah yeah that would be great <laughs> yeah, just to hold those to, yeah take a picture with those yeah <laughs> but but I gotta also say this about Kawada he's got a sweet ring jacket a ring yeah. robe that thing yeah. is sweet it's like it's like it's not fully down to his like past his knees or anything it's just like kind of a waistcoat but it looks so cool dangerous he always, he always had the cool they all did they all had great ring gear like jackets and stuff like that. Yeah. Is that, that's something you got to invest in maybe is like a sweet yeah. satin ring jacket. Maybe. I, I also think, yeah, I don't know about me, but I also know that like that was an NWA thing that all guys had to have jackets or some type of like ring entrance gear. And knowing that a lot of these guys were trained by Dory Funk Jr. You know what I mean? During that time period, like that was probably passed down to them. You have to have nice ring jackets. Yeah, definitely. It's still, it was still a thing in yeah. Japan at that time. Maybe as it was being kind of slowly but surely phased out in America, it was still a thing in Japan. Yeah. But but in in, Kaw in Kawada's corner, it's actually quite interesting. One is Takao Mori, who yeah. was like under him during this time, but before he would form No Fear with Yoshihiro Takayama. But the other person is Kentaro Shiga, who would later become part of Burning. Yeah. Like in about a year or two's time. So, but to see, to see him in the corner with Kawada was kind of interesting because those kinds of ties up between Senpai and Kohai are, are very, very strong. Yeah. So at some point, like, you know, Baba said, okay, you're going, 
you're going over, you're going over there. Yeah, you're going, going over there. there. So I guess. <laughs> and of course, our our referee, our referee is the legend himself, Kyohei Wada. And and what 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 is your opinion of of Kyohei Wada? To me, he's the greatest referee in the history of wrestling. Like, I'm not a huge fan of like him now. I think he should have retired years ago. But at this time, like for like a good 25 years, I think he was in a the most amazing referee because he made everything oh, look yeah. realistic. Yeah, no, definitely, without a doubt. There's sometimes I'll show certain referees who I like. I'm like, hey, look at this. Look how this guy did this. And he's he's the one guy that I show a lot of guys. Uh, he treated it. It was more like a sport. Yeah. The way he treated it. You know what I mean? So it's, it's just little things, too. Like, little things, like, you know, going up to Kobashi or whoever's on the ground and kind of hitting their face like you you okay? You're still in this? Right. Hey, you know what I mean? It's what a what a what a referee in like a non predetermined sport would would do is yeah. like yeah. that's not so a work, right? So it's like yeah. he's treating it like a shoot and he's like hey, you know like he could be legit checking on them because well, like, a... yeah especially during this era around ninety eight, ninety nine, he was definitely legit checking them now. Yeah, you know, with all the head drops and everything at this time period. So let let's talk about the match. So it starts off like a lot of triple crown matches at this point, especially it's like say for example, it's like between Misawa and either of these guys, either whether it's yeah. Kobashi or Kawada, would start off probably with a with a with a, like a walk up and then immediately into an elbow or some kind of strike, and then just lead into some vicious, especially between Kawada and Misawa at this time. But yeah. this match, interestingly enough, starts off with a knuckle lock test of strength. You know that neither man wins. They're kind of jockeying for position, but they neither wins the the test of strength. They're pretty even here, and then they start to grapple with one another, which on I the love. mat, which, which I I, I I was like, whoa, okay, this is very unlike a triple crown match at this time because the the intensity would just pretty much start almost right off the bat with with the depending on who was in there. Yeah, Usually, it, it was mostly because they've wrestled each other a million times already. But so they're, here they're going right into it. But this one, like you, like I was telling you before, had that old school 1989, early 90s feel to a triple crown match, which I think is indicative of how they felt about one another. Because like I think there's more mutual respect between yes. Kobashi and Kawada. Like Kobashi had this feeling with Masawa of like I like a, a deep desire and need and even desperation to to overcome yes. Masawa and. Kawada had the same thing, but also coupled that with a deep hatred of yeah, Masawa. It, it made it more vicious. In the it made way, it yeah. more vicious. So, like, you wouldn't necessarily see this kind of a start to a match with either would have with Masawa, but with one another, they don't. They they don't have necessarily a personal issue with one another. They like Kobashi wants to beat Kawada in the yeah, singles. They want the championship. The championship, and they want the, the title. Thing. Like you have the the backstory with Kobashi only doing draws and never beating him on a televised singles match. But the number one most important thing is getting the championship. This That's is right. why we're in wrestling is to be a champion. So the championship should be, but, you know, but at this point in time, they're still treating it like it's still number one. And the backstory is, like you said, Kawada just winning it and Kobashi never beating Kawada. But the number one story is winning the championship. And this, maybe this grappling takes place for like, the, f the next, you know, like several minutes. Maybe. So, like, maybe yeah. the whole sequence is oh, like. Oh, I loved it. I, 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 I love minutes. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I love that kind of stuff because um, they're, 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 they're grappling for position. They're, they're trying to figure out each other's game plan. They're trying to see where, they, where they're going to go. And I think they both know at this point because they've wrestled each other so many times. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, okay, I'm well, not necessarily going to get the advantage over like just going straight to like, you know, strikes with, with this guy. I have to try a different approach. So like, it's, yeah. it's interesting that they both feel the same way about this. I've seen it during my research for this match, Eddie, like I've seen some comments, like, you know, in certain sites where they're like, Oh, nothing happens in the first seven minutes of this match. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's yeah. tons of stuff happening in this match. But again, everybody like, I appreciate everyone's opinion. As long as you're watching wrestling, I'm good with it. But like certain people don't like that kind of stuff and or they don't see the little nuances and, and stuff like that. But like to me, I love it because it's just <clears throat> you're building. And I just love the way they would go from submission to submission. They're trying to get around each other. And also this is also the time period where MMA in Japan was taking off. So they were also trying to show, hey, we could do that. 
yeah as well and they could do that they had this very solid foundation both of those yeah. guys so um kobashi does take control of the match with a side headlock a really nice looking side I headlock love this this is one of my fit yeah just him grinding it and holding and, on to it and for good measure he lays in some stiff chops to kawada's neck so you 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 you, you definitely if you if you're familiar with kobashi and his repertoire of moves and his finishers this is very smart because now he's working to weaken the neck to set up either like the 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 the, the, the burning lariat probably or maybe even the burning hammer i can't remember if he's debuted the burning hammer at this point yet or not but he's gonna drop you on your head or, or yeah. something or hit you really hard in the neck to, to like yeah. knock you out so this is this also is one of the reasons why i love showing uh new people who want to get into all japan this match because you don't have to know that kobashi does the lariat or the burning hammer but you can tell right away okay he's working on this guy's neck it's very plain to see why yeah and then as you go on watching the match of course then you realize so that's why i like showing people this match because like look they started here with this and this is where they ended with it and it's you don't have to know all the history about you know the guys at that point uh kawada is able to break the side headlock by getting to the ropes and then he fires off a stiff chop of his own and i want to i'm going to say at this point like very few people ever mention what a great overall striker Kawada is. They focus on his kicks a lot, his high kicks to the face, his jumping yeah. gamiguris, gamiguris, and stuff like that. But you know what? He was a great chopper, and he was a great guy who threw great elbows. Yeah, and he, he, and he, he occasionally had a great looking punch too. Yeah, yeah. Usually when he uh, they would go back and forth, and he had enough, he would just go lay some with a punch. Yeah, and and a great lariat. He had a great yes, lariat as well. Yes. So he was just a great all rounder for striking, like with with someone like Tawe. Tawe relied more on like kind of the kind of the old school overhead cho chops, yeah, like, like yeah, Obama style. But it fit him so well. It fit him so well. I love and, it. And Kobashi was the chop guy. Yeah. And Masawa was the you, I I can't ever recall Masawa ever throwing a chop. No, never seen him throw a chop. So, I don't even maybe when he was Tiger Mask too. Maybe I maybe, maybe I can't remember. That's the only time I can remember and but, or even think. He sometimes kicks, but mainly it was the elbows. Yeah. But Kawada, Kawada did everything. He everything. did it all, and it looked all of it looked amazing. Yeah, he just did the kick so well. That that that's what what why it stood out to you know everybody that stands out to him. Kawada changes things up with a slap to the face, which pisses <laughs> Kobashi off, who <laughs> retaliates with a stiff chop to Kawada's neck. This chop. Like literally sends Kawada out of the ring. That's how painful yeah. it was, and and it's the first indication. If you're new to this style, and this is like your first introduction to the style, his selling. Yeah. This is the point where like Kawada's selling in this match is just throw is off the charts. To me, this is oh man. I I, I don't want to say peak Kawada because uh, you know what I mean. I don't ever want to say that, but man. Like even like I said, I show people this match a lot, but like I also show them so they can see why I love Kawada, so they can fully understand why I love him and why he's one of my all-time favorites. Is because of doing little cells like he just did for a neck chop that makes that move seem unbelievable and and makes it seem harder than what it is. He 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 just drops to his ass. Yeah. And then he, yeah. and then he's like the the momentum of the dropping gets him out of the ring, which is just like oh, yeah. unbelievable. And we'll talk more about his selling because oh yeah, cause this, it's, it's all over this match. <laughs> this match has like so much, so many great examples of his delayed selling, especially yeah. which yeah. is amazing. Uh, Kobashi follows Kawada out to the ring to the to the floor and tries to whip Kawada into the barricade, but Kawada needs a breather. And is able to land his own chop to Kobashi's neck, which allows him to roll back inside the ring. Usually, I was expecting, like, I see him hit Ko Kobashi with his own chop, and then I thought, okay, he's gonna whip into the guardrail. No, yeah. he just he's like, I need a breather. I need to get I need to get away from him. So he just rolls back in the ring, which I thought was really great, especially on my second viewing of yes, this match. Yes, yeah. When you start realizing what kind of story they're trying to tell after watching it multiple times, uh, you see how it's he's still selling. That neck chop. He's trying to get away. He's trying to gather his uh, thoughts, I guess, as you could say. 
Yeah, Kobashi pretty much smells blood in the water here. Yeah. He, well, he gets back into the ring, follows Kawada in, and he goes for a front neck lock. And obviously, this is all designed to like weaken his neck. Yeah, right to his, his neck. Yep. Right to his neck. He, he chops Kawada some more, but Kawada is able to knock Kobashi down with, with his first running high kick to the face. I love these things. Yeah. Like, no one else has ever replicated the, you know, Chono no. has his own unique high kick to the face, but no one could ever do like. They're so different, done. though. They're, they're very different. Chono's and, and Kawada's high kicks. Very different. Yeah. So uh, Kobashi fires back with a rolling savat kick to Kawada's midsection and then follows up with a with a running knee shot to the midsection, which in uh, Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 or No Mercy is called the kitchen sink. Yep. So people know that. Uh, and this is, again, Ka this running knee to the gut, Kawada mm -hmm. just sells it by just crumpling to his back in but utter also pain. If you think about it, he also puts over the spin, uh, the spinning kick to the gut that Kobashi just did right before he ran him in. Yeah, so, so it's like everything, everything counts. It does. Everything it's counts. like Kobashi's stringing together this now offense of working on a different body part of Kawada, mm -hmm. but it's like he's just trying to over do what he can to like. Oh, I see an opening. I'm gonna go for that body part. Yeah, and then also, Kawada's he's like hitting, he's hitting his signature set, as I like to call it. As I like oh yeah, for sure. Guys. Because you have to yeah, keep in mind, like, you know, one of his finishers is the moonsault, which yes. you know, he's going to land on the guy's, you know, on the guy's chest and, and probably midsection as well. So it's all, it all makes that's, sense. That's what I love about that style. Everything fits together. If you, it, you know, it's a little bit deeper, but it makes sense. Everything. Kobashi keeps keeps on the midsection. He lays in a, a several knees, including this really great looking double stomp <laughs> to Kawada, <laughs> which I thought, like, that's so unlike kobashi because it's, it's kind of like this sign of viciousness that he's yep. now adopting to, to try to take out kawada because he's like i can't i gotta do whatever i can to beat him yeah and it was like like i wrote this oh a new i wrote this down it kobashi saw an unexpected weakness oh yeah and like that's why he went you said oh no i gotta take advantage of this that's the way it looked to me no, definitely, definitely for sure. Uh, Kawada is able to reverse a vertical suplex attempt. Uh, Kobashi chops Kawada elbows. And then we just get into a sequence of like these guys exchanging like blows yeah. to one another. Kobashi chops uh, Kawada in the neck. Kawada reverses the Irish whip and smacks the shit out of Kobashi <laughs> with a beautiful reverse spin kick to the face. I, whenever Kawada does this, I go, I jump out of my seat. It's so smooth, but violent at the same time. A lot of guys can do things that are just smooth. Sometimes guys can do things that are like ugly, violent, and you know what I mean? It looks good for that. He Kawada always had both. He had yeah. the smoothness with the violence of the move. I think that's why he has the rep with like a lot of the foreign wrestlers of like he's trying to he's trying to kill me. He's, he's trying to me. yeah. Yeah. No, he's just that's how he works. And everyone else who works with him like understands that and accepts it. And it's like, well, we're just gonna give it back to him tenfold as well tenfold, so yeah exactly uh kobashi gets knocked out to the floor he tries to get back in back in but kawada knocks him off the apron with a running high kick to the face that sends him straight back he sends him flying into the guardrail yeah and and i'm sure you have taken this kind of a bump before in your career eddie is it's, it's yeah, not it's fun not i imagine fun. not fun it, at it, all especially like the momentum of flying through the air and you're going down from like the elevated part of the the apron down yeah. to the to the guardrail so but this is this is like this is something that these guys do like pretty much Constantly. every night. And yeah. Well, not not every night, but the big shows, yeah. Yeah, for the big sure. Shows, yeah. Uh, then then we get the signature Kawada kicks, peppering Kobashi's face. Yeah, I just when you know it's on with Kawada when he starts kicking you in the face with his Kawada kicks. Yeah, yeah. What was your thought when you first saw him do the Kawada kicks to the face? I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, but I didn't understand how the guys like I don't. I was always about technique. I wanted to know how he didn't break the guy's faces right. every time. But it looked so good at the same time. It looked like he was breaking them. Yeah, and I mean? it, maybe it, sometimes it, he did, but not naming names. But do you think anyone has ever uh, successfully replicated the Kawada kicks? Because a lot of people yeah, do it. Yeah, you know what I'm gonna say Loki. You know what I mean? I know. Look, I know the guy. I like him. <laughs> so there it is. You know what I mean? But yeah, Loki like definitely. Loki, you know, adopts a lot of the the Kawada style with the kicks and stuff like that, and like definitely. I mean, I would assume he's a big fan of Toshiaki Kawada. So yeah, yeah, we talk about that. <laughs> uh, Kobashi retaliates with chops to the chest. There's more Kawada kicks. 
a slap exchange between these two. Just the emotions, Eddie, at this point, are just are like at an all time high in this point and of the, match. And you know, also around this time, you didn't see you saw the exchanges, but not as like slapping each other in the face like this. You didn't see these exchanges a lot. Nowadays, you just you see it all the time. But at this point in time, you didn't really always see that. And they were just it, taking things slow. Usually you would see maybe a guy go for a choppy ducks at Big German or something at about, about this point in the match, about 10 minutes, 11 minutes in. But they're still building. And they're doing it with strikes and they're trying to just beat each other up to win. Uh, Kobashi does win the slap exchange and Kawada yeah. does this awesome, awesome delay stagger that we were talking about yeah it's just I, I i think i rewound this like on youtube like maybe five times just because like yeah. it's so beautiful i yeah I, I don't know if you notice i i <laughs> when i do certain things people can go a lot of times okay i'll put it like this when i show people this match a lot of times they'll come back to me and go oh that's where you got that from <laughs> and i go i'm not trying to steal it or do it or bastardize it i'm trying to do it right but yeah Things like that by Kawada is just such uh, such beauty to it. You know what I mean? Because he's still trying to fight through the pain. That, to me, is the perfect definition of, of fighting spirit. To me, you the greatest I mean? sellers in the history of wrestling, the two, yeah. two of the greatest, are him and Shinjiro Otani. Yes. Like, they're, the, these guys were like, when I started watching Japanese wrestling, which was in the 90s, it was like, oh, my God, these guys are yeah. on a different level, like, Kawada's doing it in all Japan and Otani's doing it in the New Japan Junior Japan. Division. Yeah. So it's, it's just like, oh, it's just a thing of beauty. Uh, from here, we get a Kobashi DDT. Uh, the second one is blocked by Kawada, who lays in some stiff kick to Kobashi's back. Oh, oh yeah. Beautiful, oh, yeah. brutal. Uh, Kobashi is pissed and tries to slap Kawada, but Kawada blocks it and hits it and hits it one of his own and then goes, follows up with this awesome, awesome lariat. And then you know, from this lariat, Kobashi just goes to the outside and battles with Kawada on the apron. Kawada wins that exchange by hitting a beautiful axe kick to the back of Kobashi's yep. neck. Where, where it's like, you know, Kobashi's draped over the top rope. And Kawada just gets such an amazing height on this axe yeah, kick. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I can't do that. My Everything will explode in my <laughs> leg if I try that. I can't even get it like maybe a quarter of the way up from my, my like my own leg oh. here. So like that would be impossible. Yep. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. I'll I'll continue with the oh. match. Kawada goes there after go. Kobashi. Has to get neck. the light on. Yeah. Too dark oh no, there. it was getting a little dark. It's okay. Yeah. No, it's all good now. Uh, yeah, Kawada I also I also want to point out like I know we're going from spot to spot, but for anybody who's not watching the match. After Kawada hits the lariat on Kobashi, the way he sells just the the battle that he's already had with Kobashi in the ring is, is beautiful. He didn't just hit the lariat right away and then they ran outside, you know, outside the ring. He hit that lariat and he slumped over because he was still beat up from before. So he still was selling what happened before. <laughs> He's well. I also, I don't think it's so much selling as it's like legit exhausted at, at this point. Yeah, well. at this point, yeah. Also, by this time, the fans must have been thinking like, "Are, the, are we going to get another draw?" Right. Yeah, you know because I mean? it's because it's, it's 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 hitting almost that 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 time point. Yeah, and it's so. the first defense for Kawada. They've done it before. They've done it twice before. So, you know what I mean. It, that's that's a that's just another layer of drama when you take everything into uh, into it. Kawada continues his assault on Kobashi's neck with a series of knees, including a beautiful jumping knee to the back of his neck. Uh, Kawada takes control of the match from here with kicks to the head. <laughs> Kobashi is able to mount a, mount a small comeback, but gets cut off with another running boot to to his face. Kawada basically owns Kobashi for the next four minutes until he's able to block a step up kick to the face with a chop to the neck, and then follows that with a running neck, a running neck breaker that he's stolen from Giant Baba. Giant Baba, yep. But again, everything on the neck, everything goes back to the neck. And and uh, you know, of course, we should mention that Giant Baba is doing commentary yeah. for this match. Yes, he is. You can. And you'll the, know. You'll know who he is. Folks. Yes, he has the very unique tones 
that is very giant Baba esque. Yeah. So, uh, Kawada blocks several German suplex attempts here, including one by using a version of, of the Pele kick, so to speak. Before the yeah. Pele kick was even a thing, Kawada was doing this back kick, like where he would jump behind himself to kick yeah. his opponent who was standing behind him, which is just. And like, sometimes he would get them in the back, sometimes he would get them in the head. You know what I mean? It was, it was there, it was in there. Uh, Kobashi is able to block a Kawada punch and hits the half, half Nelson suplex. Now, this is 18 minutes in. Yeah. I remember so, just making sure that I looked at the time because, again, this is why I love this match. It's different. Usually, they would be about 15 minutes in, maybe. They would start hitting their signature stuff, and they would have to go bigger and bigger and bigger, but they were setting a different pace in this match. Well, well they would have hit the Germans at least by this point. Yes, by this you know? point, yeah. But they were... Yeah. All the Germans were they like not there wasn't a single German suplex in this thing that was actually successfully completed. Yeah. It's Ko, it's it's Kobashi who like really starts the kind of the, the suplex sequence of the match that you would expect from all yeah. Japan match with the with the half Nelson. And that's a move that I know you're a big fan of, the half Nelson yeah, suplex. Yeah. It's a good move. It's a fun move. Not for my opponent, but for me it is. Uh, hey, as long as it's not you taking it. I, no, it's no, okay. I'm good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh yeah, hold on. Okay, so Ka Kawada blocks a uh, powerbomb attempt, hits a kick to the face, but is met with another chop to the neck that he sells with another awesome delay slash stagger. Yeah. Like, and I, again, this is something I will just always go back to is Kawada is so amazing at yeah. selling. And just, it's, a, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's, it's not just in his face, it's in the way he uses all his body to like yeah. express like what he's feeling at that point. And, and look, a lot of it is probably legit because these guys took a lot of punishment in these they matches. They did, but he's he's one of my inspirations for why I sell the way I sell in the ring. I try to be as realistic as I can because that's what I felt Kawada did uh, during his career. I also heard a rumor that he looked up like he studied people getting knocked out or getting knocked loopy, so he would learn how to sell it in the ring. That again, I've never that's heard that a rumor I heard. I've never heard that. Well, uh, maybe y'all. You know, We'll get some confirmation from that from someone. Maybe who, I don't know. Maybe I'm who knows? bullshit. I don't know. I heard who it knows. Well, maybe it could be true. Uh, from here, Kobashi is able to hit the power bomb. He then rolls Kawada up and hits a tiger suplex that he's stolen from Masawa because it's yeah. not a, this is not a Kobashi move. This is a Masawa move because yeah. now he's like thinking, I got to use Masawa. Masawa can beat this guy with I, this move. With this with, move. With this move, the release tiger suplex. Yeah, and and yeah, it's the release version. And this sends Kobashi, this sends Kawada into another, another fucking great, dimension. Another great, just him getting to he the ropes rolls. and slumping over. Yeah, trying to get out, trying to get out because he knows he just took that vicious Tiger Suplex. Uh, Kobashi goes for a cover, but only gets a two. Uh, Kawada blocks a Kobashi moonsault attempt and, and is able to counter a jumping chop with a jumping kick that connects to Kobashi's forehead. So, yeah. so Kobashi, K Kawada's on the, on the, on the, on the mat. Kobashi's on this on the top. I'm sitting on the second or the top rope, and then he's gonna jump to hit him with a chop. But Kawada jumps up and lands his jumping high kick to yep. Kobashi's forehead. The, the timing, yeah. the the oh, aim, the aiming of this, yeah. oh, it's unbelievable. And this unbelievable. is like what Eddie? What are we at? Like 20 minutes into this about matchup? 20 at this point? Yeah, definitely about 20 minutes. And like I said, it's 18 minutes. I made sure to check for the half Nelson suplex. Uh, Kobashi blocks a Kawada spinning kick, but Ka Kawada counters with a Gamangiri, the jumping kick to the face. Uh, yeah. I love it. I love it more than the Enzigiri. I love the Gamangiri a yeah. lot more. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think but it looks better. Know. You know, also, like, every like, again, I'm a technique guy, so seeing how he didn't murder when he could have, it's, it's a thing of beauty to me. Kawada then lays into Kobashi with a combo of stiff kicks to the back and stiff chops to the chest. Actually very reminiscent of something like his mentor, Jinichiro Tenru, would do yeah. in the corner, like peppering you with punches and chops. Chops, this, yep. this is, but Kawada doesn't do that. He does something kind of like that, but with his own signature with the kicks to the with back. The and I, I, it's just like a complete assault. What, what, is it, what must it feel like to get assaulted like that, both like the front portion of your body and the back? <laughs> It's a no-win situation. You don't know where to go, what to grab, where to, you know, rub. Like, where's the pain coming from? You don't know. <laughs> so, you and this is, and this is all while, 
this is all while Kobashi's in a seated position. So yeah. essentially, he's defenseless yeah. at this point. At, at this at point, Kobashi, yeah. at, Koba- at Kawada's mercy. Uh, Kobashi reverses a brain buster attempt and goes for a cover, but Kawada kicks out and then hits an awesome string of super of a super kick to the face. Well, a kind of a version of super kick. Yeah, uh, a layer to the back of the head and another jumping kick to the face, and yeah. then spikes Kobashi with the back drop driver all within a two minute time frame it's awesome and the funny funny thing is if you you know with the history part maybe i'm looking too deep into it but the sequence that he did was uh besides the backdrop driver was the same sequence he pulled off against dr death to win the triple crown the first time and so it was like uh larry to the back of the neck and then a gamma gurry and then the pin but then he added in the backdrop driver, which in the tag matches, like the, the world famous tag matches, he's beaten Kobashi with before. So that's why the people who were in the know at the time are, are going so insane at this point in the match. And these fans are all like, they, they've been following it. They know. Yeah. They don't have so to. It's they, the little detail. To me, that's King's Road styles, the little details like that. And it's yeah. not like they can go back and like go onto YouTube and watch it. No, it yeah. exist back then. But also now, if I put this on for somebody who doesn't, they don't need to know the whole history. You know what I mean? They just know Kawada's the guy that, that's throwing the kicks. You know what I mean? And now he's trying to win. And now they're like, oh, God, what is, you can still enjoy it without knowing the backstory. So, like, there's no, what is the word, gatekeeping? Is that a right <laughs> Yes, word, I think term? maybe, maybe. I don't yeah, know. Like, I don't, it's not I don't like know. you're not, you can't watch, you won't, you can't watch this. You won't understand it. You won't. Yeah, no, it. no, no, no. Matches like, like this. That. Matches like this, everybody can understand. Yeah. Everyone can understand the struggle and the pain and wanting to win. Well, hopefully, if, if they watch this match and they want to get more you know, details, they're, they're listening to us, right? Yeah, right after. Hopefully, hopefully. And then they, yeah. they're, getting, they're getting the, oh, that's why they did that. Yeah. Uh, Kawada lays in more strikes and hits the folding powerbomb, but only gets a two. Yep. Kawada hits another folding power bomb, but he, th- th- you know, this is like in a in a mid card match and on, on a house show. Like this is going to be a finisher for someone yeah. lower than Kobashi, but he can't kick Kobashi down with his folding power no. bomb. He's going to need multiple power bombs, and that was the thing that they did to tell stories with each other, especially is that they would always have to either hit their finisher multiple times or come up with a new finish which was always a dangerous move yeah yeah. but for each other only you know what i mean so it it made the matches mean a little bit more when it would happen and also made the guys stronger you know what i mean it made the four pillars stand out because they would kick out of finishers or it would take a new move or it would take multiple times hitting the finish to win so yeah it's going to take more than just two power bombs three power bombs to beat kobashi he 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 switched Kawada does switch it up and then he starts applying the stretch plum uh, yep. a move invented by uh, Joshi wrestler uh, Plum Marco. Um, mm-hmm. and I love this move. I, yeah, so do I. <laughs> I, I love I love the seated version, I love the standing version of this. Yeah. And and you know, he, he's just cranking it on Kobashi here. This does not look like it's fun to be in, no, not at all. And that's the point of the move. We don't that's want it to make it look like we, I'm sorry, it's not we. Kawada doesn't want it to make it look comfortable. Uh, there are kicks to the back of the head, another head drop from the backdrop driver, mm-hmm. and then uh, into a. So at the first, he's doing a standard seated plum, and then he does a sequence of moves, and then goes into the seated stretch plum on on Kobashi. Uh, you know, here's a great little detail though, like that I noticed. Kawada wears himself out by yeah. cranking on the stretch plum to a man who won't surrender. So he goes for a pin, but Kobashi kicks out at two because he doesn't have. He just he's just exhausted all his energy. Kawada has. It's, yeah, it's the same thing if you have a for at the MMA guys. It's the same thing as when a guy goes for you you're going for a front choke and you're squeezing with all your might and your arms are getting tired and you let go and you can barely keep your arms up. This is basically the same thing. He was wrenching on it, wrenching on it, wrenching on it, and uh Kobashi wouldn't give up, so he just was tired. Plus, can to remember he also just took a half Nelson. That's true. Suplex as well. Uh, Kobashi powers out of another powerbomb attempt, but then gets kicked in the face. And both men are exhausted at this point. Yep. Uh, Kobashi survives another series of kicks from Kawada and then catches Kawada's leg and hits one of the nastiest looking 
dragon screw leg whips I've ever yeah. seen. I, I kind of think he goes the other way as like a Tatsumi Fujinami would do it or a great Mudo would do it. Mm. I think he goes the opposite direction. Opposite just, way. But it, what, the way Kawada oh my God, uh, the way Kawada sold it and Continue. <laughs> I mean, it was just like the 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 angle that his leg bent. Like I yeah. am surprised. It, That's a very scary it. move. Even yeah. if you do know what you're doing, like that, it's still scary. Uh, Kawada it, it recovers from them. He hits another high kick, but it doesn't have as much momentum and or power. So Kobashi is no. able to shrug it off and hits Kawada with a stiff lariat, but only gets a two count. Kobashi signals for his moonsault, but Kawada. Smartly, he rolls out of range of it, which I thought, yeah. I like. I'm just gonna do the simplest thing: just get out of the way. Just so get out of the way. And it's this is what I also love about the style, is that the psychology of the match, besides the callbacks, was very sport orientated. Like, here's my game plan. This is what I'm gonna do. If I have to switch up the game plan, it's because something happened in the ring, like Kawada selling his gut. Kobashi had to switch his game plan. It's very simple. Get out the way. Roll out the way. Get out of the way of danger. So it's, it's more sport and fight-oriented psychology. There is another chop exchange that Kobashi wins with a rolling chop to the face. Ooh. <laughs> I, those, never, those never look like, yeah, those always look like they hurt. I'm surprised you don't see, like, you know, guys who take that move, like, just swell up in their eyes or Ooh, whatever. I don't, I don't know. But again, technique, man, technique. Uh, Kobashi hits his jackknife power bomb, uh, but only gets a two. Uh, there's a second power bomb, but no cover. Instead, Kobashi goes to the top rope, hits the moonsault finally for a one, a two, kick out, and this and Budokan Hall is going completely insane oh, yeah. now. They're going nuts right now. They're they're doing the foot stomping. Oh, you know? I love that. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, Kawada waylays Kobashi with a low savat kick and follows up with a kapo kick right to the head. It's just like. He does that spin. He spins for it, hits. Just and the go. accuracy, the accuracy yeah. of it is incredible. It's this is another, game. another, another thing that like Loki does really well. That I, I'm, I'm would assume is uh, inspired by Toki, Toshiaki Kawada. I believe, uh, and Liger too. I believe, and Liger too. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, uh, Kawada goes for the Gamangiri again, but it's blocked by Kobashi, who then hits Kawada with a short range lariat that knocks him down. And what follows that is nothing short of amazing as. As, you, you have to watch it. I can't do this justice, but no, you know, yeah. Kawada's staggering back up. He dodges. He staggers away from Kobashi, only to connect with his own jumping gaming jury yes. to, to Kobashi. And you have to see this sequence it's, to believe it's, it's real. Yeah, it's fighting spirit. The definition of it, to me, is Kawada fighting through that lariat, trying to get up, trying to keep fighting. Kobashi now trying to, you know, get back at him, you're trying to stay on him, and then hitting that uh, last second Gamma Gurry. Because now, if you, for it to come all together, for me personally, is that now both men are down, Kawada hit the move last, but it's Kobashi who makes the cover. Yeah. Kawada's drained. That was desperation. That was fighting spirit. So, to that point, the next exchange is really significant because there's another chop exchange between these guys mm -hmm. uh, that Kawada stops by pulling guard from a standing position. Yes. And then he goes for the, the cross chest arm breaker yes. on like, so he's, he pulls guard on him. He drags him down to the mat and then he goes for an arm breaker, like a submission yep. move that yep. popularized by like, you know, like MMA, the MMA style, the UAWFI style. Yep. Uh, and even in like New Japan, but that's something you normally see in all Japan. So yeah, it's like, I, I think it more had to do with, I think he beat Gary. I think at this time period, he beat Gary Albright with it, I believe. But also, like you said, it's the MMA influence and it's on Kobashi's right arm. Yeah. It's on the arm that he throws the lariat with. It's right. Very important detail. Yep. Uh, there's, there's a, you know, Kobashi's able to survive. He gets to the ropes. He breaks the hold. There's another set of kicks from Kawada, uh, but Kobashi hits a desperation lariat on him. And yep. Kawada hits Kobashi with another jumping kick to the face. And then Kobashi, this is also great. So this Kobashi kind of does a similar thing to what I talked about with Kawada. Yeah. He staggers around dodging Kawada and then from out of nowhere, just hits another amazing looking larry and i just both the, the 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 staggering and like running around the kawada does earlier and yep. this i i watched these like 
10 times. I just went oh, rewound it's, it's, and watched it's it. It's amazing because they don't know where they are. They've been hitting each other with their bombs now. You know, and Kawada don't know where he is. Kobashi's arm is feels like it's numb, probably. You know what I mean? You can get it. You can understand why they're doing it. I have in my notes that the selling alone make this makes this a five star match. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, it does it does for me personally. I mean, it's a clinic. Like I, I would assume that you're gonna like tell some someone like a young guy or young young woman in the back, like, oh, you need to work on your selling. You should watch these guys. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, it's always what I point to. You know what I mean? Like I tell people, for me, the guys who inspired me with my own selling is. These two, of course, Kobashi and Kawada, but guys like Bret Hart, too. You know what I mean? Like, these guys just have, to me, this is the perfect King's Road 90s style match. To me. Right. To me. Because of the selling and the, the selling shows fighting spirit. The selling shows the struggle to keep going, even when it doesn't look like you, you're going to win. But you still keep going anyway. And the selling shows that. Yeah. So Kobashi does go for a cover from this lariat, and yeah. he only gets two. And, and then Giant Giant Baba, <laughs> I, at the point of commentary, he sounds like he's about to cry. Yes. Because he's just yes. watching some absolutely beautiful professional wrestling. And whatever problem he he had with Kawada about, you know, things like backstage or politics or something like that. Yeah, had to go away. He, with he the went away because like... he, he loved Kawada as a professional yeah. wrestler. So um, Kobashi, <clears throat> you know, uh, kind of grabs K Kawada, you know, grabs a complete out of it, Kawada. Kawada's out of it. He's yep. just, like, done. And here it comes. Kobashi grabs uh, grabs him and then decapitates him with, with the, the burning, burning lariat, lariat yep. for the one, two, and the three. And, the three. and Kobashi has finally done it. He's beaten, not only beaten Kawada in a singles match, a televised singles match, but he's also won the Triple Crown for the second finally, time in his career. From, from Kawada. From Kawada. From Kawada. And in, in 33 right minutes. Before, right before yeah. he hit him with that, with the burning lariat, the way I, that, one more time, give it up for Kawada selling. He picks oh, yeah. him up to hit him, and then Kawada just drops. He just drops. And picks him up again, like, nope, I got to hit this to put you away. It's a thing of beauty. I say, you know, he decapitates him. Obviously, I'm talking metaphorically. But, metaphorically, yeah, yeah. But for him, it's, like, literal because he just looks like he doesn't have a head anymore. He's just, like, the yeah. body has fallen down. But uh, this match is 33 minutes and 49 seconds. And honestly, it doesn't feel like it. No. Uh, no. With with my set, with my first viewing, like, I was like, okay, okay. I'm, 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 I'm watching it. I'm just, like, trying to get a feel for it. My second time, I'm taking notes, so I'm analyzing it. But I'm mm -hmm. like... And I'm like, oh no, this doesn't feel like it's more than I feel like a kind of a 20 minute match to be honest. Yeah, with you. it doesn't. It doesn't feel that long because everything goes, everything's smooth, everything makes sense. And when you you can watch this and get emotionally invested just on the way they sell. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. the beautiful part about this match. That's it why is. I show it's... it to everybody. I don't show them, you know, my personal favorite all time match, the June, you know. 94 match, which me and Joseph have a little bit of beef about between <laughs> Kawada and Masawa. But I don't show him that match. I show him this one because of that. Because you can get emotionally invested just on the guys selling alone. And not just the moves, which is the, the best part of the whole thing for me, personally. Yeah, so go out of your way. This is one of those matches. And, and just so people know, Eddie does Eddie's the one who did pick this match. He gave yeah. us a choice of two matches he wanted to talk about. And your second choice, we'll say, we'll we'll do for a future appearance. If if you if you decide you, you enjoyed this yeah, experience enough yeah. to we'll come back about, in the future, we'll, we'll talk about that match too. That's another one I show people. But this is absolute war. Go out of your way to see it. We'll have a link in the description for for yeah. for you. I'll link probably to put watch it up it. on my Twitter. At some oh yeah, point. for sure. Yeah, I constantly uh, do that. Uh, this would be. Kenny Kobashi's second title win for the Triple Crown. His first was over uh, Akira Tawe in 1996. Uh, you know, the, the first reign, I just want to talk a bit about it, had Kobashi beating Stan Hansen for, to. I think that was the first time he ever beat Stan Hansen. Yeah, that was, his that first, was the, like, his, his grown-up moment. Like, That's you right. made it. Now, you may be the champion, but now you, you finally beat the big bully. You've officially made it.
And then, uh, of course, we also referenced his second defense was going to a 60-minute draw with Toshiaki Kawada before losing the title to Mitsuharu Misawa. And one and of the this- many amazing wars. Matches. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People, like I, I always say, like you know, Kobashi, I know Kawada Misawa is amazing, but I think I prefer Kobashi Misawa a little bit more. Like I the, think the series matches. If you know the backstory of Kawada and Masawa, you, you may lean towards that more. But if you're just watching for the sake of watching, oh yeah, without a doubt, it's it's Kobashi and, and Masawa. Especially uh my personal favorite of the all Japan ones was the one I think they did in '99. Only reason why I I just love that match, but I know it by the beginning because I don't know where Kobashi goes for a cross arm breaker on um, Masawa's elbow right in the beginning of the match. And yeah. I was like, oh man, I'm here now. So they, 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 you know, they wrestled each other so many times before that. Yeah. It's like, got to do something different to, to yep. not to draw in the crowd, but also like to make, make their rivalry. This match makes sense. Even but more. this, yep. this, this second title reign that we're, that we just, we're going to start with this win over Kawada. Would have two sex- successful defenses, one against uh, his protege Jun Akiyama. What and, amazing and, match! Yep. And 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 uh, and a def- successful title defense against Kawada's tag team partner Akira Tawe before losing the title to, you guessed it, Mitsuharu Masawa. So oh, yeah. that was and so people want to know like is Masawa pulling some kind of politics bullshit or something? No, no. The story was always going to be eventually Kawada. You know, Kobashi was going to beat Masawa. Because Ms. Kobashi was Masawa's choice to be the guy who's going to replace him as yeah. the face of the company. Yeah. So, but to do that, you you know, the All Japan style is, hey, you can't. That's the goal you have to attain. We're going to tease mm-hmm. that, so you're not going to beat me for a while. Especially, and I I beat you twice already for this title. But so the next time that maybe Kobashi Kobashi does win a, a third time against Vader. Yeah. But I think you know the the GHC title when we see in Pro Wrestling Noah in at Budokan. That if if the split didn't happen, that would yes, have happened without a doubt. Yeah. in all Japan. That would have happened between Masao and, and Kobashi for the triple crown. So yeah, yeah, that was definitely he was well now we can look at it and and you know break it down, but he was definitely the next one in line. He was gonna be the next uh all Japan ace, if yeah. you, if you really think about it. You he, know well, I mean Masawa was wanted to he he was like feeling it, so he wanted to kind of yeah. like phase himself down to the mid card, and then okay, Kobashi, you can you and Akiyama and whoever can kill yourselves now. Yeah, you got you guys do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna be the promoter. Control. I'm just gonna be the yeah. booker and the promoter. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a great match, Eddie. Uh, thank you so much for for picking it. I had no, a blast thank you watching for talking it. to me about it. Like I said, I watched this match before every big match, before even before my recent match with Chris Jericho. I watched this the night before. For some reason, this match brings me a nice calm zen when I watch. Well, it. I, I, I'm hoping when you Santana Ortiz get in the ring with with uh, Jericho, Daniel Garcia, and and uh, or with the the, the 2.0 guys that yeah. that you guys are going to recreate maybe the classic Super Generation Army versus Saruta Gun, <laughs> uh, Cork and Hall six man tags. I'm, maybe I'm trying to get Monkey, well, aka oh, Ortiz, aka Monkey. That's what I call, I call him, Monkey. I'm getting him to watch more Kikuchi. Oh, is he gonna be Kikuchi? I'm telling him watch more Kikuchi. I just I like Kikuchi's fire. You gonna get I, Santana to watch more Masanobu Fuchi then? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tell him this to be a real, real asshole. You know, like be able to people. hide that punch while the guys in the headlock yeah, hide it from the ref. I love I love him too. Him and Tawe are those guys that I just love because let me tell you something. That's my goal. When I get to a certain age, I want to be like Fuchi and Tawe. <laughs> Where it's just, you know, little sneak shots here and there and eye pokes and stuff, you know. It's good. It's all good. Those guys are so amazing. I could talk about this for another hour about everybody. Well, we'll, we'll save it for years. a future yeah. episode. I, I yeah. you, like, I'm, I'm assuming you want to come back at some point in yeah, the future. Yeah, of course. Of course. As long as I don't get in trouble, I'm good. <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry about it. it it's, l- listen, look, I'm wearing this shirt. Okay. So I, I don't care. That's it's all, all good. good. It's all, all good. good. It's yeah. nothing to do with you. I know we you. talked before. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I just love this. I love the storytelling and I love this style so much that I just want everyone to know about it. <laughs> That's why when Joseph comes out with something new, I'm the first one to put it up on, on my Twitter. Or when you guys have a, a podcast, I put it up. I just, 
I don't know. I just want to share the joy that I have watching these matches. And yeah, a lot of them are very long. So guess what, guys? Just watch the highlights. <laughs> okay. No, I just, you'll, get, you'll get the gist. It's just if you love professional wrestling, you don't care like how long these are. Yeah. Like it's it's not like long for the sake of being long. They're they're long because they're telling a story. Yeah. And the more you watch it, the more you're rewarded with the, the small details, like you're saying, Eddie. Yeah. And uh, yeah, with that in mind, do you have any, do you have any plugs you like? You like to watch AEW here? Dynamite and Rampage? There you go. And any pay per view we have, and, and any go. Battle of the Belts. How about that? There you go. Awesome. Uh, I don't know my Twitter. My girlfriend's not here to tell me in the background what my Twitter is. Okay. Or my we'll get it, we'll get it up on the description. I think really, anyone's watching this knows what your your Twitter yeah, is. Yeah, I know so it's okay. Eddie Kingston eighty one on Instagram where I just put random rap videos up and uh from the nineties recently it's been Joshi. Stuff. I've been seeing you've been yes. putting a lot of Joshi up. So yeah, well I'm a huge fan of of, of course Toyota and, and I stole my finisher from Aja Kong, but Bo McConnell was my girl. She was my personal favorite, still is, you know, so yeah, I watch. I try to watch everything, even if I don't like a certain style. Yeah. I'll still find the appreciation in it because, to me, pro wrestling is fucking amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it you is fucking I mean? amazing, definitely. And well, I just I wanna... want everyone. I want everyone to love it. That's especially this style because yeah. this is the style that inspired me and still inspires me, as you can tell in my matches. You know what I mean? Where I try to find all the details I can because of matches like this. All right. Well, before we go, I want to I want to say thank you for one tweeting about the Junak Yama biography. Well, thank, uh, you brought, and th thank you for also wearing uh, this shirt on Dynamite. <laughs> no, no, seriously. Whatever I know. I know. happened after uh, doesn't. It's not on you. It's it was great for us. Uh, great for me personally. Like my my Twitter because I was coming <laughs> home from work. I wasn't watching it live. And then all of a sudden, I'm just like, why I got all these notifications on my oh, phone? Oh, man. Those it's are like, scary. Did you watch it? Did you watch it? Did you watch it? What? What are you talking about? And then people sending me the clips of you wearing uh, coming out on Dynamite, yeah. wearing it at, top of, at the beginning of the show. I'm like, whoa. Awesome. Yeah. And and thank you uh, for coming on this show. Uh, of course. I, I really appreciate it. And we'll have you on again. We'll, 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 we won't we won't reveal what the second match that you picked. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll save it for that for for the next time you're on. And uh, yeah, you can follow me at WH Park Nine. You can follow all my work here at postwrestling.com. And uh, you know, John Way just did a massive job like covering WrestleMania week. And and uh, but the 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 the. The, the, the great audio, the great content continues with Eddie Kingston here on the Long and Winding Roller Road. And we got so many other great shows coming up. Uh, you can follow me on Post Perez talking about the overall Japanese scene as well as MCU Later with Waiting at the ca Cafe Patreon. And we're talking about all the, the Marvel shows on Disney <laughs> Plus. So that we do a lot of different things here at Post Wrestling. But uh, I still until the next. I haven't seen Moon Knight yet. Oh, you haven't seen it I yet? I haven't seen it yet. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Okay. No, it's it, the first it's episode good. is really interesting. I, are you a fan of the comic book? Yes. It's a little different from the comic book. I would just okay. say that. Okay. It's different, but like, I'm a huge fan of Oscar Isaac, and I think he's fucking amazing oh, in the show. Actor. Great actor. So, yeah. like, I, I, for, I want to see where it goes. Like, the first episode okay. was like, okay, it's, it's intriguing. I want to go. So, but, hey, hey, you know, Eddie, you can also listen to me and Way talk about it every week if you like as well. Ah, oh, there he goes. There it is. Well. There's the businessman. There it is. I love right. it. So until next time for Eddie Kingston, thanks to all the listeners. Thank you so much to everyone who's bought the the, the revised shirt of the, the pillar shirt from, from Post Wrestling. Um, just so people know, 30% of the t-shirt sales are going to two great causes. One is the Japanese Red Cross and one is for Doctors Without Borders Canada where we're going to donate, we're, we're going to, you know, where a lot of effort of the money is going to go to help support people who are in the Ukraine who can't get medical assistance right now. So really two really great causes. Thank you so much to everyone. Who's, I'm going to eventually, I just want to tell people, I'm eventually going to get around to reading your names and I'm not boasting here, but we sold so many of these shirts that it's going to take a while for me to organize a list and just kind of do a piecemeal to get to, and then people are still <laughs> buying the shirt. So there you go. But thank you everyone who bought the shirt. Uh, Eddie, you know, I think we sent you the new one. Yeah, you did. You if did, you, you did. if you if 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 like you know your your friends in in proud and powerful need shirts as well, you want to wear them on TV oh. in the future <laughs> together as a group. We can make that happen. Make Just hit happen. me up, hit hit me up and hit me and way up in the in the in the private messages. We we can talk about that later. But until yeah, next I'll time, I'll have some. for Eddie Kingston. Thanks for everyone for listening, watching, 
And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>